Good evening, everyone. You must have had a busy afternoon. This is the quietest this group has been in the last two days. Whoa! We've got a great, great program for you this evening. I know you're going to enjoy it. I'm actually so proud of what ALPA has done with this flight training program because a long, long time ago, when I was there, we got really concerned about what we were doing to make sure that the flight training community recognized excellence. And we said we're never going to point the finger at things that don't work, but we sure as heck want to recognize things that are working. And AOPA under Mark Baker's leadership has just taken this uh, further and further and further. And so it's, uh, it really is a great pleasure to see where the program stands. And I think you're going to, if you haven't heard a lot about it, you can learn about it more tonight. You're going to see some of the some of the results from the, the work that's been going on over the last year. It's also a special pleasure for me to, and I'll, let's welcome them up on stage. Elizabeth Tennyson and Chris Mosier from AOPA. These, these two folks are at the heart of the program, and I'll tell you a little bit about what they do. I just wanted to share that uh, people ask, ask me, and many of you have asked me, do I miss working at AOPA? And, and I do in many ways, but I really miss day in and day out are, are the, the kinds of people I had the chance to work with. And Elizabeth Tennyson was one of the absolute finest. She had experience uh, as the editor of uh, Flight Training Magazine, so she knows the flight training community. She has experience uh, <laughs> working with me and writing, writing on pretty much every topic that I touched upon over the five or so years I was there, and there were lots of them. And uh, has just done a great job. And to, to the good fortune, of uh, the aviation community generally, and NOPA specifically, Elizabeth moved back into the area a few years ago and, and uh, once again worked full time at the headquarters at NOPA. But uh, to both of you, thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for taking a little nugget or kernel of an idea and growing it into something that's really become very exciting. With that, I turn the program over to you. Chris. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. All right, you guys, good evening, everybody. Enjoying dinner? You ready to do this? This is going to be kind of cool. So welcome to the 2019 Flight Training Experience Award Ceremony. We're proud to recognize the winners of our Flight Training Experience Awards that we do every year. And of course, the purpose of this is to recognize and celebrate flight schools and flight instructors that provide a customer experience to pilots of all levels and facilitate their entry into the aviation community. But before we explain more about the survey and awards, I wanted just to take a moment to thank some of the great organizations that uh, allowed us and helped us make this happen this year. There we go. So first, I want to thank Redbird for allowing us to present here at Migration again for the fourth time since we first collaborated on this back in 2016. So Redbird Migration, I'm, I'm hoping you realize there's a lot of first time folks here, is honestly one of the premier events in the flight training industry. So thank you so much Redbird for letting us host this here. The other thing we like to do is like to thank our sweepstakes sponsors because what we do every year is to help incentivize your customers to take the survey, we um, offer some sweepstakes prizes. And so as you can see right up here, we had quite a few uh, that stepped up this year, including rental car certificates, um, uh, Aircraft Spruce had a gift certificate, uh, free courses from Sporties and pilot workshops, so some really great stuff. Uh, and it was really kind of fun to give those away and, and to see the surprise or when we make that call and let people know that they won that. Now. Something really cool, as a special bonus, this is for the second year now, uh, in special recognition for the contributions that our flight training providers make to the flight training community, Lightspeed has donated Zulu 3 headsets that each of our regional best CFIs and each of the regional best schools will receive. So the, the kind folks at Lightspeed are going to be sending those out directly to those winners. So I don't know if you realize it or not, but when you guys came here tonight, our winners, you're getting a Lightspeed headset, a Zulu 3. Pretty cool. So, the survey and awards are part of AOPA's You Can Fly program, and to go into a little bit of deeper perspective on what that program is about, I am pleased to introduce You Can Fly's Executive Director, Elizabeth Tennyson. So, hosting this ceremony every year is really one of the best evenings that we get. 
because it's a chance for us to talk to you in person about the great work that you do. You know, we deal with a lot of flight schools on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we answer questions, we try to solve problems, we hear the struggles, we hear from you just how challenging this business can be. And yet, you're out there every day on the front line with students teaching them, sometimes being afraid for your lives. Uh, you know, you're out there creating the great experiences that create new pilots. And for that, we're very grateful. When you serve that community well, you're serving our entire industry well. And so it's a real honor for us to be here tonight and speak to you in person and say thank you. So these awards are part of AOPA's You Can Fly program, as Chris said. And uh, that program was born a few years ago out of a few really critical realizations. The first one was that if we didn't intervene in some way, the pilot population would keep shrinking, as it had been since the 1980s and that that was really unsustainable for our industry. And the second realization was that no one intervention would solve the problem. You know, this was a long time coming. Uh, the pilot population had been declining steadily over a period of decades. And so there was not going to be a magic bullet, even though we would have all wanted one. So in creating the You Can Fly program, we identified four key areas where we had an opportunity to intervene not to duplicate great programs that are already out there. Things like Young Eagles, uh, getting kids flying. Lots of stuff is going on that's wonderful in our industry, but we wanted to find an opportunity to fill the gaps and do things that others weren't doing. So we started with our high school program, and that was all about introducing young people to aviation and the career opportunities that await them there. Then we looked at flight training. You may have heard this number today. 70 to 80 percent of students who start flight training will drop out without earning a certificate. I mean, that's unbelievable. How do you sustain an industry like that? So we wanted to see if there was something we could do there. Then we wanted to make flying more affordable. If you talk to pilots, they'll tell you their biggest obstacles are time and money, which are the biggest obstacles to most things in our lives, right? So how can we make it easier and more affordable to fly? And how can we give you reasons to go to the airport and build that community of like-minded aviators out there? So we started working on flying clubs. And finally, bringing lapsed pilots back. Has anybody here ever quit flying for a year or more? Yeah, a lot of hands. And we find that everywhere we go. People stop flying because life gets in the way. Life is complicated and difficult and, you know, messy at times. But they're still pilots. They want to come back. So how do we make it easier for them to come back? And that's our Rusty Pilots program. And the good news is, taken together, these initiatives are really, really working. Right now, more than 5,000 students in more than 160 schools in 34 states are using the AOPA Aviation STEM curriculum to learn about careers and opportunities in aviation and to prepare them for higher education or jobs in our fields. More than 130 new flying clubs are starting around the country. That's serving thousands of pilots, and they're actually flying more, which is exactly what we hoped for. And more than 7,500 lapsed pilots have reported to us that they are back in the air after taking the Rusty Pilots course. So we are seeing real numbers with real meaning that are bringing people back into our industry. And while we're very excited and proud of all that, it would not be possible without you. We can create the programs that you are the people on the front lines teaching these people to fly, getting them back in the air, giving them recurrency training, helping them be safe pilots. And for that, we are truly appreciative. So tonight, we are proud to recognize you and your contributions with our instructors from every region doing incredible jobs of bringing students into aviation, turning them into lifelong pilots, giving them reasons to keep flying. All of you tonight, our award winners, are part of an extremely select group. And I'm gonna ask Chris to tell you about the awards so you can know just how select that group is. Cool, thank you, Elizabeth. Cool. Okay, just a little bit of background. The Flight Training Experience Survey and Awards are based on some research that AOPA did about what makes the best flight training experience. In that research, they identified four areas 
uh, where they were critical to making that good experience. Number one was educational quality, two was customer focus, three was community, and then the fourth was information sharing. Now, it might seem like doing these kinds of things would just be common sense, but delivering on that every day takes commitment and hard work. So the fact, I know that folks here, they're in the flight training providers that we have, and of course our award winners, I wanna thank you for making that commitment every day to providing that great flight training experience. Now, before I announce our winners, one thing I did want to, to just reflect on a little bit is that we get an awful lot of data from this. When you think about it, people are lucky to get maybe 200, 300 responses to a survey. This year, we had over 7,000 people that responded on your behalf, your customers, letting us know what they thought about the service that you're providing. And one of the aspects that really stood out in there that I thought was just interesting when we were analyzing the results was that creating a personal connection was kind of a key theme this year we kind of noticed. It's something that just jumped out at us. Now, as flight instructors, we all know that teaching somebody to fly is an intensely personal experience. Whether it's from sitting in the tight cockpit of a 152 or turning them loose to go around the pattern for the first time while you pace nervously hoping they make those three landings just right. Or just the really cool part of watching them mature into confident and uh, mature aviators. We know, and I know, I bet it's the same for you, that a lot of our clients become lifelong friends of ours through that process. The trust that they put in us as flight instructors and as providers goes way beyond any kind of typical business relationship. I know I've personally experienced how important it is to have a supportive CFI who can motivate and guide you through kind of the challenging parts to reaching those goals. So I just want to thank you because I'm pretty sure that you take the same kind of pride that I do and the same kind of satisfaction in helping somebody achieve the dreams of flight uh, and getting through the challenges that are there. So thank you for what you've done, everybody. Now, what you've all been waiting for, it is time to reveal our award-winning schools and flight instructors. Joining us shortly are two of my colleagues, Pablo Morelli and Keith West, to help us deliver this incredible experience. So there are two categories of recognition in the Flight Training Experience Awards. The first is the Distinguished Instructor in School. These are schools and instructors who have delivered a high level of service to their customers, which is based on that direct customer feedback that I mentioned earlier. It really is a mark of AOPA's confidence that you are providing a great flight training experience. This award is granted to flight schools and instructors who have to have, to have had at least five independent reviews from those survey respondents and had to rank in the top one-third of their region. The scores are based on that feedback in those same areas that I mentioned from the research, and this award can be attained every year. Now, to give a little perspective on what being a distinguished school means, or distinguished flight school means, or instructor, please consider the following. There were 972 independent schools reviewed this year. Of those 972 reviewed, 51 are receiving the Distinguished Flight School Award. That puts them in the top 5.2% in the, the results that we had, and the top 3% in the nation. So I'd like to invite our 2019 Distinguished Flight School winners to please stand right now for some recognition. For our Distinguished winners, please do stand. Yeah. Yeah. For our distinguished flight instructors, there were 1,876 different instructors reviewed. Of those, 53 are named as distinguished flight instructors. That puts them on the top 3% in our awards and better than the top 1% in the nation when you consider the number of CFIs that are out there. So will our 2019 distinguished flight instructors please also stand for some recognition as well. <laughs> Congratulations to those schools and instructors, and thank you for doing what you do. And by the way, after the, all the activities are done tonight, we will be doing photographs, so I do want to invite our distinguished uh, instructors and schools to come up for a photograph after everything is all done, because we know we have the Redbird Awards coming as well. Now, the awards are structured around six geographic regions, and our hope is in doing this sort of division of the country is that we get a little bit of excitement, maybe some friendly competition among the flight training providers, but most importantly, we wanted to offer the opportunity for people in different parts of the country to be able to fly and train with the best. And it's a, you know, hopefully a more convenient way for them to identify who somewhere close to them will do that. And we do hear stories from previous winners that people will come from out of state to fly with you, even get on a waiting list to fly with you. And I see some nodding heads even from Zoanne right here, our, our best national CFI two years back. So. From each region, 
a best flight instructor and a best flight school are selected from each of these regions, as I mentioned. In addition to those regional best, there is also one who will be named our national best CFI and our national best school. The twist is that they don't know who they are yet, and we were going to reveal that tonight during the ceremony. So hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun with that. So this year's survey, as I mentioned, had 972 different flight schools. From those that rose to the top, one best flight school was selected. This comes from a process of a combination of quantitative and qualitative analysis, including a committee process that uses a blind review of industry experts and CFIs to pick who that person will be. So we are now uh, you know, proud to announce our best regional flight schools. From the east, AeroVenture Flight Center from Mansfield, Massachusetts. So please come up to the stage. AeroVenture from their customers. One customer said, AeroVenture is, in my opinion, the best flight school I've attended so far. AeroVenture is, without a doubt, the most professional, attentive, safety-conscious organization that I've ever seen. The staff are courteous and always available, and the instruction is organized, engaging, and clear. So congratulations to AeroVenture. <laughs> Our best flight school in the southern region is King Sky Flight Academy from Lakeland, Florida. Customers for King Sky said, the staff is incredibly supportive, friendly, and professional. The CFIs are all friendly and professional, and as a veteran, they've been incredibly helpful in assisting me in my pursuit of a commercial rating. I'm glad that I chose King Sky. Congratulations to King Sky. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. From the Great Lakes, Spencer Aviation from Delaware, Ohio. There we go. Come on up, Spencer. I know Michael's here. One of Michael's customers said, Spencer Aviation's Flight School has been an absolute pleasure to attend. They consistently provide outstanding customer service, expert instruction, and good value to their students. I would highly recommend Spencer Aviation to anyone interested in learning to fly. Nice job, Michael. Congratulations. From the Central Southwest region, our best flight school is Nationwide Aviation in Weatherford, Texas. <laughs> the, one of their customers said, the culture at Nationwide is like no other in the sense that it exceeds all other flight schools I've attended in both quality and professionalism. The school has become my second home and the staff my family. I mean, what a review that is. Congratulations, Nationwide. All right, our best flight school in the Northwest Mountain region, SkyTrek Alaska Flight Training from Anchorage, Alaska. I know Jamie's here. One of Jamie's customers said, SkyTrek should win this award for their ability to make you feel like part of their family. They open early, stay open late, move around their personal schedules to make the training happen. They work together to provide an efficient and friendly training atmosphere. Congratulations, SkyTrack and Jamie. And our best flight school in the Western Pacific region is Sierra Charlie Aviation from Scottsdale, Arizona. Come on down, Sierra Charlie. Some of Sierra Charlie's customers said, I feel like it's not a school, but a community where everyone supports each other and share the love of, it, of flying. If you have questions, just ask any instructor or the owner himself, and they'll help. And this is my favorite part of their quote. I feel like they care about your success as much as you do, and also, their staff is pretty cool. Congratulations, Sierra Charlie. And now, I have the pleasure of revealing 
our 2019 National Best Flight School. Pablo, the envelope, please. <laughs> Thank you, Pablo. The results have been sealed by the firm of Pretty, Dern, and Close. And the award goes to Aero Venture Flight Center from Mansfield, Massachusetts. Congratulations, Aero Venture. In their results, Aero Venture mentioned, or their folks, or their customers, rec or, <laughs> I'll try that again. In the results, Customers said they were friendly and family-oriented. They were quality people. I know one even named Deb outright, so Deb is one of the most amazing people I've ever met. Up-to-date equipment and technology, balanced learning, both theoretical and practical, so you, both sides of it, and that they were transparent and budget conscious and, and provide a great value. So let's hear it for AeroVenture, our 2019 National Best Flight School. All right, and now to introduce our 2019 Best Flight Instructors, I'd like to welcome back to the stage, You Can Fly Executive Director, Elizabeth Tennyson. <laughs> what a great reaction that was, huh? Um, and to see so many people from one school here tonight, that is fantastic. Talk about the, the kind of spirit, the kind of community that keeps people coming back and keeps people flying when you see... <laughs> When you see that, uh, you really appreciate what's great about what we do and why we're here. So for the best flight instructors, this year we had 1,876 CFIs nominated. But of course, only one can win in each region. Like the best school award, this award is given to the flight instructor with the top overall score. It's a combination of qualitative and quantitative scoring the data is analyzed by a committee of CFIs and industry experts in a blind review process. And the award may be won in consecutive years. So now for this year's winners. We're gonna start in the east. Our best CFI in the eastern region is Jim Stover of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Congratulations, Jim. One of Jim's students said, he is the most professional and knowledgeable CFI I have ever had the pleasure of learning from. His teaching style is exactly what I needed. He's organized and explains concepts in detail and makes sure I understand the whys and the hows of aviation. Congratulations, Jim. <laughs> Moving on to the southern region, our best CFI in the south is Christopher Kresge of Mill 2 ATP Aviation in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Now, unfortunately, uh, Chris couldn't be with us tonight, but I do want to say a few words that came from one of his students. They said, he is easily the most passionate, hardworking, selfless aviator and instructor I've known. I've flown with plenty of instructors in the military and beyond who know they will collect accolades from my success, but that's not him. Among all of them, no one dedicated their time and effort to my success like Chris. We're sorry you couldn't join us tonight, but let's have a round of applause for his success. In the Great Lakes region, our best CFI in the Great Lakes is Mike Bywinga of Blue Skies Flying Services, Lake in the Hills, Thanks. Illinois. There he comes. One of his students told us, great instruction, explains maneuvers completely, never gets frazzled really knows what he's yeah. teaching, always encourages, always like leaves you feeling good about yeah. flying. Yeah. He earns the award with every client. Yeah. Congratulations, Mike. Thank you, Thank you, Congratulations. In the Central Southwest, our best CFI award goes to Howard Davenport of Texas Flight in Houston, Texas. Howard's student said, this man is truly a father figure to me. When everyone else had given up on me or flat out refused me as a student, he worked tirelessly to motivate me, then convinced me not only was I worthy of the CFI rating I was chasing, but that I would be an amazing instructor. 
So I think we can really see that Howard turned a life around right there. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, Howard. <laughs> the best CFI in the Northwest Mountain region goes to David Novotny of Colorado Springs, Colorado. His students said he is a commensurate professional in his field and has a genuine concern for his students' learning. He approaches his duties in a professional manner that students are eager to emulate. Safety is his first and last item on his checklist, <laughs> and he ensures that all his students do the same. Congratulations, Congratulations David. <laughs> Our last region, the Western Pacific. Our best CFI in the Western Pacific is Kinsey Moss of Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix. Kinsey? Her student told us, Kinsey is one of the most professional and knowledgeable instructors I have come across in my life. She constantly made me feel comfortable and safe in the plane, as well as not intimidating me or making me feel inferior. Kinsey is truly passionate about flight instructing. She's patient, knowledgeable, and a skilled aviator. Congratulations, Kinsey. And now for the envelope, Pablo. <laughs> this time I'm actually going to ask you to go ahead and rip that open. <laughs> I'll let you take it off. Thank you. <laughs> and the winner of our best national CFI is Christopher Kresge. As we said, he could not be with us tonight, but that gave us an opportunity to, uh, to fill him in a little early. So we gave him a call and had a quick little conversation with him. So we have a video to share with you about Chris. One of the things that we uh, wanted to give you a call today was, as you know, we let you know that you are our um, best CFI in the Southern region in the Flight Training Experience Awards for 2019. Um, you got some amazing reviews uh, from your uh, folks there that train at Milta ATP, and I know you uh, focus on helping, uh, basically it's guys coming from the military, folks coming from the military to train to get their that ATP? Is, oh, yes, sir. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I read the comments last night that you sent me, and quite frankly, I'm flattered that uh, one, the guys took the time to fill the survey out, and boy, a couple of the guys wrote a novel, and so um, I, anyway, I was flattered the guys would take the time to fill out the survey. I certainly do this as a labor of love, so. Um, I also wanted to let you know that not only are you our regional best CFI in the South, but you're also the national best CFI this year. Wow, that's triply flattering then. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's certainly due to my co customer base. I have, uh, every flight school likes to think their customers are the best, and I absolutely do too. And then, you know, the support staff that uh, makes me look good really is I think the reason why, why the guys rate us the way they do. Um, we have an incredible just an incredible program here that really loans itself to uh, to being successful. So I'm flattered. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And in fact, I know it's well deserved just based on the comments that I read as well. Um, and I'll ask you one other question. Do you have any uh, any tips or secrets that you might share with other CFIs to kind of show like what what do you what is it that how do you approach it that might be uh, maybe your secret sauce or maybe it's just something you even consider something like well everybody should be doing this. It's it's almost unfair, quite frankly, because I don't uh, I don't do this for a living. As I said a minute ago, it really is a labor of love. So uh, I'm a retired F-15 E pilot, uh, and then I'm also an airline pilot for a major airline. So I'm a I, I can do this. Uh, I can I can put in 12 or 14 hours teaching ground academics because I really enjoy doing it. I think I've uh, I've been blessed with. Uh, a job that I love and so is it really a job and, and that's really how I look at it and how I view it I, I'm not trying to build hours I'm not trying to make money I simply enjoy flying I enjoy teaching uh, even teaching ground academics I like seeing a light bulb come on so yeah I'd like to see everybody should be doing this but I, I also appreciate that uh, as an old guy my circumstances are certainly probably unique um, and as I said again having the best clients in the world makes it easy awesome well, obviously well-deserved um, recognition. So congratulations on being our 2019 National Best CFI for the Flight Training Experience. So congratulations to Chris and all our winners. Come on over and join me, Chris.
I think labor of love is how he described it, and I think that's probably true for very many of our winners here tonight. You do this because you love it, because you care about aviation, because you care about your students. So we're very impressed with all that you do. Thank you so much for being a part of it, and thank you for what you're doing on behalf of students everywhere. Chris? Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you again for celebrating with us tonight. You know, the Flight Training Experience and Awards were created to promote the best in flight training practices and to recognize those who excel in doing that. So I am confident that our award recipients, and I know that most of you are all models of doing that. So we're looking forward to spotlighting our winners this year throughout AOPA communication channels. So join us just one more time in congratulating all of our 2019 winners. And just a quick reminder, we will do photos afterwards. So um, I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce Josh. No, Charlie. Charlie's going to come on up. And, uh, and now we get to see the really cool stuff, these moon awards as well. So let's just see what happens with the moonshot, as it were. Thanks, Chris. Uh, congratulations to all the AOPA winners. That's a huge accomplishment. One more round of applause. Thank you very much for joining us here at Migration. And thank you so much for doing that. Um, if I could have Dave and uh, Paul and Julie join Ethan over here off to the side for, uh, for, the, for the pitch off later, we can get you, get you ready to go there. We had, we had an interesting, uh, I would say the submissions were interesting for the, the Challenge Awards this, this year, but the, uh, unfortunately we only had four awards to give out, so of all of the great submissions that we got, I, we have, uh, we deliberated. It, it, it took a lot, but we've found the top four uh, Migration Challenge Award winners. And as I announce your team, team if you can come up here and, and collect your trophy from our lovely assistants over here, who are not over there. Over there, there we go. Um, and then gather over on this side of the stage here, if you could, um, and then we'll bring you up one at a time to pitch off for your chance to win the grand prize. You're not going to want to pass that, miss this. <laughs> so the first award, the roughly 2.57 times 10 to the negative third AU award, goes to Team 21, the Extended Squitters. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't clap when I've got a handheld here. The 102.47.11 award goes to Team Number 22, Red Moon Express. The Bean Counter Award goes to, actually, there's a, for, this is a first, this is a first in migration history. We've had a team abdicate the throne and decide they did not want to gather, uh, take, take the trophy. And so, the runner-up, and this will be interesting because they haven't been told they're the runner-up and now they have to come give a presentation on stage. Team number two, because we can. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. I see you. And the Right Stuff Award goes to team number 11, It's All a Hoax. <laughs> okay, so here's how this is going to work. I'm going to turn the stage over to Josh, who's going to run the migration pitch off. This is the first time we've done this. He's going to welcome each. Uh, he'll, he'll talk through how we're going to handle this. Each team will have three minutes on stage to pitch, and then they're going to get grilled by the panel of judges. Um, about the plausibility of their of their exercise. Josh? Thanks, Charlie. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're going to get started. So first, uh, let's walk through some mechanics. In your app, there is a session for on the agenda for today called Migration Challenge Awards. If you go there, you click on that session, there will be a poll. And what we're going to do is we're going to listen to everybody's pitch, get the questions from the judges, and then we'll open up live voting, and we'll show it on the screen to see who the winner will be for the grand prize. So I, re I recommend that you take diligent notes from everybody's pitch, maybe devise your own scoring system so that way when the, when the poll gets open, we're able to uh, accurately judge their presentations. So first off, I'd like to bring up team number 21. And remember, you have a three minute pitch period and then you're gonna have several questions from the judges and I'm super strict about the time. People gotta go home, so come on up. <laughs> team 21.
So uh, Dan, Dan is going to be our pilot, but Dan's going to help us present. Dan, Dan, are you all right? What? Come on. Come on. We got, we got to present to these guys. Where's we, the old man? The old man? I don't know. Where's our, where's our leader? He's, he's commanding all damn there, things. He's in the bathroom. All right. Come on. Come on. That guy, I'll tell you what. He, kid, he, I, he doesn't know how to do his job. Sir. Lieutenant Bell. Captain Bassett. Do you understand the mission? What is the mission? <laughs> We're going to get into one of those tube like things with. Wait. Are you sure you're not the commander? And we're going to fly over and we're going to get the helicopter. And uh, the, uh, well, shouldn't we do a time hack first? Time hack! 2300 hours. Ready? 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 Hack! Hmm. Well, at least we know what time it is. You're in charge. Did you really think I knew what the command was? Yes, sir. I don't know. You answer that one. I will. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 All right. Our mission today is to inspire tomorrow's pilots. I T P. We're going to take off. We're going to go pick up the new R B. Wow. R. <laughs> The RB Squiddle Shutter. The it's the new from Redbird. Uh, we just got the uh, got it today, getting it, and then we're heading to. Uh, there they are. To the elementary schools. Uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin Elementary in Schaumburg, Aldrin Elementary, Western Virginia, and Buzz Aldrin Middle School in Montclair. We are going to give these guys something to remember. And do you have any more details here, Captain Dan? Quite right and right, baby. <laughs> Captain Dan, you're grounded. Let's go, guys. We got to go. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Is that the, the, the completion of your presentation, your that pitch? Is. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, I applaud you for both aerobatic or uh, uh, whatever that is, gymnastics and brevity. So good job. Winner on my count. Uh, judges, do we have any questions? Maybe what their actual plan is? Yeah, I've got a question. Captain Dan, can you please defend your choice of the Hellas Lager over the IPA? Well, the IPA was a little too hoppy, I thought. And, uh, you know, this kind of just went down and didn't really give me that whole, you know, floaty feeling. Okay. Oh, no. No. Camera down. All right, judges, next question. Well, you never talked about Area 51, but do they know you're missing from Area 51 now? We can neither confirm nor deny. Yeah, just an uh, uh, observation that this, this, uh, this commander is in serious danger of a fragging. <laughs> okay. All right, Team 21, thank you very much. For good ADM grounding people, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, now we'll bring up Team number 22, uh, the winner of the Closest to the Time Award. Good evening, uh, my name is Chris Peterson. I'd like to welcome up here Thomas Leach. We don't have with us Steve Graham, but uh, Linda Scully and uh, Tama Nao uh, Nao Naoya, sorry about that. And these guys were a great team. I tell you what, we worked really hard on this thing. We ended up putting together three different, uh, three different aircraft. We had our uh, a helicopter, a Bell 505 Jet Ranger, which we found on controller.com. We took a uh, Pilatus PC-12, also found on controller.com, got N numbers, serial numbers, and uh, then we ended up actually uh, investing a little bit in the NetJets and bought in it to a share of a Global Express 6000. 
So we ended up leaving Earth, Texas, right? We go to Muleshoe, Texas, and our Jet Ranger. We leave from there in our Pilatus and shoot out to Teterboro. Now, the reason we went to Teterboro is this. We got a red envelope, okay? We got, and in our red envelope, it says, like Apollo 8, Apollo 10, and Apollo 13, they didn't make it to the moon, and you're not going to make it to the moon either, so you don't get to land at the moon. So then we ended up having to uh, do a few other things there. We landed at Teterboro, at which point we picked up our Global Express 3000. Where do we decide to go? We decided to fly it on down to Key West. And down in Key West, well, we ended up meeting up with Jimmy Buffett. We sang a little Margaritaville. It was 5 o'clock somewhere. And then we met up, uh, took Sammy Hagar and Shania Twain. We all ended up on uh, Jimmy Buffett's airplane, the uh, Hemisphere Dancer, uh, and his Albatross. And we toured around for about... 11 hours or so in that airplane. It was really awesome. We threw a huge party. And then in addition to that party, it was a fundraiser. And what was it a fundraiser for? It was a fundraiser for this very museum right here, the Wings Over the Rockies Museum, so that we could come back and donate a large amount of money, whatever we could raise, to this fine museum. After we left there, we decided, hey, we've got this Global Express. We might go somewhere else. So how about we go out to Maui? So we flew out to Maui to take a look at Charles Lindbergh's grave, you know, just to see what that was like. And then we left from there and went up to Nova Scotia to take a look at the uh, total eclipse of the sun. After that, we decided to return back uh, via Teterboro and then back to uh, Muleshoe and then back to uh, Earth. And what was that? Oh, that's right. And we did, in fact, circle the moon, just like Apollo 8, 10, and 13. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Successful mission. Okay. Um, team, 21, or team 22, just a point of clarification. How many aircraft did you fly in during yours? Was it exactly? Three total aircraft. Three total Three aircraft, aircraft okay. yes. All right. Uh, judges, do we have any questions for Team 22? Did you see the green flash? I'm sorry. Can you say that one more time? Did you see the green flash? Oh, we did, and the northern lights, and it was beautiful. It was amazing. <laughs> you know, you're... We, we gave you a pass on your budget for all those touch and goes, the landing fees at Teterboro. You didn't <laughs> include those in the total. Yeah, we, we knew somebody. So, you know, they, 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 uh, they hooked us up. Did you think this song was about you? <laughs> well, I was, I was a little vain, but, you know. Oh. Okay. Good one, Hirschman. Any more judges' questions? All right, I think that's Thank it. You. Thank you very 22. much, point, Team 22. <clears throat> okay, so what team number is this? It's not 13, right? Team 2, I will need to edit the poll. Uh, okay, Team 2, come on up. <clears throat> All right, go ahead and start. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're here to show you and I happen to be the spokesman for the group. My name is Michael Phillips. And these three fine gentlemen you see here went to Moon. They went to Moon, Pennsylvania. And but what really is more important is Albert Glenn, Chris Erlinson, and Hal Fury. What we did is we volunteered to NASA to be three average folks, an airline captain, a flight school owner, and a bureaucrat, because <laughs> we can, to show them we could go to the Moon. And so on this particular process, we took off in a helicopter, because we can. We ended up at Ellington Air Force Base. No, excuse me, we went to Gray Army Air Force Base first, special training at Gray. Then down to uh, Ellington Air Force Base for special training at Johnson. And then from Johnson, we went on up to, um, we had to make a stop because, well, no, no, Albert forgot something very important, and we had to stop in Olive Branch, Mississippi, to go ahead and pick up what, well, actually, it was not Olive Branch, but right close to Olive Branch. <laughs> well, we needed another airplane besides, because our R-22, uh, excuse me, we had an R-66, which we were all had packed in, had was time to replace it. So, actually, I think it was in, uh, we picked up a Cessna 172, and the rest of our training was going to be done at all of the various, at the military and at Kennedy Space Center. All of the training that we received was done in the 172. Many, many hours in the 172. Oh, almost 202.75. Because we can. And then from there, 
we worked our way up the coast, and we found ourselves up at Wallop. I think it was Wallop from Fort Training. And then we had to get one more airplane, and at least two of us had to go on into the moon. And how did we do that? Well, Al flew the 172. These two gentlemen got in a STEMI motor glider, and off they went on their way to the moon. There happens to be, if anybody taking a look, at moon, there's a football field right next to, right next to it. So Hal flew there, flew over the airport, while these two gentlemen came in, landed the STEMI at moon, and that was how three guys made it to moon, and then, of course, because our accountant did such a magnificent job. You want to share with them how we did that, sir? Well, first and foremost, we believe in fiscal responsibility because this is the taxpayers' dollars that we're utilizing here. And uh, by the way, thank you, taxpayers, for helping fund this project. Really appreciate that. So we started off with a Robinson R66 at 1.280 mil, a uh, Cessna 172S with avionics tow package decked out all the way, that was right at 900 grand. A STEMI glider, 400,000. A Redbird MCX, Cessna 172 version, because we wanted to make sure that everyone was properly trained in operating a pandering, Cessna 172. Pandering, pandering, pandering. Uh, I, I, that's all, I'm just saying. Uh, matter of fact, because we were yet inexperienced in the R66, we also purchased an FMX R66 because we wanted to make sure that we knew what we were doing there. After you added all of that up, you put in fuel for the 172, the R66, the glider, hotels for us because, you know, it's a nice trip. We need to be taken care of. Food, and then, uh, and then our salaries because uh, nobody donates time in the government and in government projects. Our grand total turned out to be $4,999,999 and... 99 cents. We were within one cent of budget. Below budget. Below budget because we believe in government efficiency. Okay, thank you, team number 13. Judges, questions? Hold on, stay up here. Judges, questions? Anything? Did you remember to carry the seven? <laughs> well, 10 to the three. Yes. Yeah, you're busted on the kickback on the 172 price. <laughs> yeah, nine hundred and eighty thousand dollars for a one seventy two is it's it's like even even the a gold plated toilet seat from the Pentagon couldn't match seen. that. Well, <laughs> it's technically advanced. We use one of the updated versions yeah, of updated. autopilot. You're right. So I've never seen that Cat before. Three qualify <laughs> okay. because we didn't know this is you know. All going right. To thank the you, team number. This is there. team number two, not thirteen. <laughs> Clarifying, team number two, not thirteen. All right. Last but not least. Uh, after this presentation, we'll open up the voting. Team number 11, the winner of the Right Stuff Award. Come on up and let's get started. Oh, you got fans. How about that? All right, go. Well, we uh, really appreciate everyone else's stories. Um, this was actually created after a recent experience that uh, Chuck and I had. Um, unfortunately, it cost one of our crew members their life. Uh, we started on September 21st with our uh, buddy Steve, ag pilot out of uh, Earth, Texas, decided to go uh, with that rush, the uh, Area 51 program. Uh, Steve got all the way in there, made it back September 30th with uh, a lot of great footage, uh, some great stories to tell about Area 51. Uh, unfortunately, 24 hours later, the FBI, CIA all showed up at our farm. Um, apparently, they weren't real thrilled with what happened. Uh, so they told us we needed to go get debriefed. Uh, Chuck offered his uh, buddy's 170, his Cessna 170. We flew up to Roswell to meet with the folks, uh, myself, Chuck, and Steve. Uh, once we arrived, uh, they wanted all the information that we gathered. They weren't quite sure what they'd lost. Uh, so we began to negotiate. We said that, you know, Steve had some pictures of some pretty cool aircraft. Uh, in exchange for us giving all the information and forgetting all about it, uh, we just needed to go on a little bit of a ride. Uh, so they did provide us with a uh, nine-orbit trip aboard a TMG Federation uh, Type 6 shuttlecraft. Um, 
copied by Hollywood and Star Trek. Uh, but we, we took this thing for nine orbits, um, eventually meeting in uh, New Hampshire. I believe it was uh, Twin, Twin Mountains, Twin Mountain. Twin Mountain, New Hampshire. There's a secret government base that, uh, disguised as a maple syrup farm. Um, <laughs> once we got there, uh, Sikorsky provided us with the S-70 to uh, go ahead and head down to our next stop, which was West Twins. West Twins, um, where we actually went through the full debriefing. Um, as you can imagine, it took uh, three days, ultimately re resulting in uh, about 102 hours and 40 minutes. Um, and we, you know, they, they interviewed us all. We, we went through, I mean, imagine your worst medical, physical. Uh, CIA was pretty brutal. Um, probes, you name it. Um, ultimately, they, they finished up with us and uh, told us they were sending us to the moon. Um, they kept Steve, God rest his soul, um, and, and we climbed aboard, and they actually didn't send us to the moon. They sent us to Moon, Pennsylvania, and as a Cleveland Browns fan, that's as close to hell as you can get. Um, <laughs> that's Pittsburgh. I mean, Christ, I'm in Denver right now, which is my other foe. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we went through this whole experience, and uh, while it was quite fun, we, we paid a heavy toll. We had our $4 million budget, but the uh, $5 million budget, but the, uh, the human price was much greater. So we, we thank Redbird for the opportunity to tell our story. Uh, if this is the last time you see us, at least you've all been made aware now. And we, uh, we hope that you can continue to tell our story and uh, let the world know the truth. Okay, thank you, Team 11, for that interesting uh, journey to Area 51 ish. Uh, judges, any questions for Team 11? Was it grade A or grade B maple syrup? It was, uh, it wasn't grade A, it was dark amber. Which? Dark amber. Yeah. Okay, that's important. When do we get Steve's remains back? There's a number of things about this project that can't be disclosed in this uh, particular <laughs> venue. <laughs> And when will we when will we be seeing this on the Netflix series? Because that just seems this just seems like a perfect. You probably won't ever hear or see any of this again, <laughs> or us really. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Team Eleven. Thank you to all of our teams that participated and all of our winners. Everybody's a winner here, but nobody's a real winner except for one team. Um, so, hopefully, we'll pull up a live poll. There it is. Open your app, go to the agenda, go to Migration Challenge Awards, open the poll, vote for your favorite. We're going to give it just a couple minutes. While we're at it, judges, do you have any comments in general about how the submissions fared? What was the level of probability that of any of these various submissions? Would, would, it, would anybody actually accomplish the mission? Uh, we went over these with a great deal of rigor. We examined them as carefully as we could. And we determined that there is zero probability of any of them succeeding. Okay, okay, understood. But you do have to admire the mix of, of uh, technical savvy, paranoia, and creativity that went into some of these. And, yeah, and, any, uh, any really egregious abuses of the taxpayers' dollars? Many, but there was, I gotta say, there was great consensus among the judges on who the winner should be. And uh, and that consensus seems to be being borne out by the results of the, uh, oh, the survey as wow. well. Oh, wow, judges le leaning in on team number 11. Okay, uh, any other comments from the judges about any submissions we saw? Anything you wanted to see? Was was there something that made total sense for you, but you, you just never, you just didn't see it in, from any of the submissions? I never saw an actual, you know, ICAO standard flight plan. Yeah, that's unfortunate since, you know, there is four flight. So they could have just put it in four flight, took in a screenshot. Really a miss, guys. Yeah, really a miss. Good job, guys. <laughs> and also, I should say that, that uh, Team 11 is the Area 51 guys, the fire. Yes, crew. yes. They actually were a late entrance. Oh. And one of the others we had picked as, as, as first, but it was so entertaining <laughs> that we couldn't possibly not pick it as number one. Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to wrap up voting in about 30 seconds. So one more question or comment from the judges. Where do you see the future of this program going? 
Is this something that should happen every year, maybe every week? Should we send missions from Earth, Texas to Moon, Pennsylvania, maybe daily? Do you think that's a valuable use of the taxpayers' dollars? <laughs> okay, no comment. Excellent. All right, so we're going to go ahead and close the poll. Charlie, do you want to come up and uh, officially announce our winners? Sure, we're going to give this about five more seconds. Clearly, you can tell that with the migration challenge, it's more uh, important to be entertaining than to actually adhere to any of the rules. So... Um, Good job. We have a, man, it is neck and neck here. It is neck and neck. What, do we have a timer on this or we just let I, it go? We're, we're rolling at two minutes and 30 <laughs> seconds right now. Uh, all right, we're going to. We want to roll it till three minutes? No, I, I think everyone wants to go home. and we gotta, Okay, all right, yeah. We got to go home. Prize. All right, we're going to disable vo voting now. <laughs> okay, so it looks like team number two in a late comeback. Did I read that right? Team number two. Come on up here. <laughs> team number two. <laughs> Team number two, <laughs> the beneficiaries of an abdicated trophy. <laughs> Voter fraud. Come on up, come on up. Come on it's up. It's rigged. And now for the big reveal. We're going to need all of you for this. And the, and the answer is, for the trip from the Earth to the moon, what better then 96 moon pies. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Michael. Happy birthday to you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for participating in this very, very dumb game. Whatever you want. We you greatly take, appreciate it. Um, if we could put it back on the slideshow. I, I got it. That, yeah, moon pies for breakfast tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. I think that'll be a wrap for tonight. Um, we start at breakfast tomorrow at 7.30, and the main session gets started at 8.30. So thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, and uh, as a reminder, if you are an AOPA award winner, please come up to the stage uh, to get your picture taken.